Good evening. It's Dylan Panko live with Adam Crail. We're going to be talking about towing an Opus safely. So tonight we thought we'd start off with a video I've been working on for a few days. Um, play that and then towards the end we'll answer your questions, comments, and uh, go over some more details that I overlooked while filming this. The, I shot most of it today kind of on a whim uh, without much time, but I wanted to make sure we uh, got it out to you. So Adam, got anything else you want to add? Uh, no, I think uh, we can just go ahead with the video and, and maybe people get some questions as, as we watch the watch the video and uh, and then we can do some Q and A after that and we can put, we can touch on some points that um, we each uh, have been thinking about. Cool. Well, with uh, again, it's on Dylan uh, Bluebeard Adventures, and without further ado, let's dive into this live stream and uh, learn together. So. We can talk over this, Adam, and hopefully the audio is not too bad talking over it, but um, that's the lock and roll hitch, if I'm correct. Yes, not the DO35. I'm still lagging on the video. Oh, okay. There we go. Yeah, that's the lock and roll hitch. The, the DO35 is the uh, new one. Okay. It didn't come out with. One of the things you can see here is that I do have a couple of twists in the chain, and that is all right. You want to make sure you have a gap between the ground and the, uh, and the chains. You certainly do not want them dragging, which this video will go over in just a moment. Have to turn me what? Yeah. <laughs> She said that she has to turn you all the way up to hear you I can over make the myself video. louder. There we go. Yeah, just Yeah, Oh, okay. Just realized we're not actually visible in the video, so I'd add that in there. It's a breakaway cable with seven pin connector, and you can see I'm stepping on it, making sure absolutely everything is connected. Away and get into some more uh, finite detail. I spent the uh, afternoon filming. I love the rims on those trailers. All right, Adam and Dylan, you ready? Let's jump into this live stream. So first thing we're gonna be looking for is checking the tire condition. I've got this tire jacked up, or the suspension jacked up on one side, and the uh, trailer brake released. So the tire can freely spin. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a slow spin. I'm going to put my hand on the tread. If there's any cupping or warping, <laughs> that's something you need to have checked out. Cupping it's might be an indication the bearings are going bad or have an issue in there. Uh, uneven wear where it's wearing, say, heavy on the inside or out. And then, uh, so the tread is thicker on one side than the other. It might be an indication your alignment's out. So things you should have checked out. Also, I'm going to be looking for you know, gouges, tears, rips, punctures. There's a rock in the tread, but that's not a big deal. I'm also going to be looking at tread depth. If you look at the tread, you'll find that there's a spot where all of a sudden it looks like it's a little, the tread isn't quite as deep. Those are known as tread bars. Those will show you like how much, basically how much tread is left on the tire. In California, where I'm at right now, and Adam, um, if you get below the minimum uh, tread depth, I mean height, what's remaining, they won't repair a tire. So say you get a flat, you're going to have to buy a new tire. So keep track of that because if it gets too low, you don't want to be stuck somewhere and then having to buy a new tire at a place you don't know. I went up the street to a local tire shop and they wouldn't let me film on the premises, but they let me borrow some tires and let me return them without having to pay for it. Yes, these are grossly exaggerated examples, but they're examples nonetheless. This would be an example of an underinflated tire. See how the outside is worn more than the middle? This tire wasn't properly inflated. And I, and I was just talking about this with these tread bars. So those would be the tread bars. These little bars that go across here, those are the tread bars. This tire is no longer legal to drive on. You're past the minimum depth. Another hazard with driving with these is like through rain and snow. You can't push, you can't dissipate the rain water and the snow well, fast enough to get it out of the way and you start to hydroplane. If you see any amount of steel belt <laughs> showing through, showing have that. this fixed right away. <laughs> this is super thin. I can almost tread bars that pronounce. Yep. That's so thin I can push my finger through it. When you 
you see any amount of steel belt, like there's not much right here, you see any amount poking through, get it addressed immediately. Last but not least, a good example of uneven tread wear from side to side, which uh, indicate a bad alignment. See some little bit of tread left here and no tread left here. Indications your alignment needs to be taken care of. So again, grossly exaggerated, but they get the point across. For the outside sidewall, I'm gonna be looking for bulges that go out, those are bad. Um, dips that go in, generally run along here. If they're small, that's not a big deal. It's pretty much normal. I'm also going to be looking for gouges, rips, tears, and punctures. But I'm not only looking, I'm feeling. And I'm going to do the same thing, but on the inside of the tire. Forgive me as I don't feel like climbing under there right now, but that's what I would do next if I was going to be towing. Next, I'm going to grab the tire at three, or I mean, at 12 and at 6 and push in with one hand, pull out with the other, and I'm going to do this little shimmy. I don't want to feel any free play or hear any noise when I do that. Then I'm going to grab it at 9 and 3 and do the exact same thing. Again, I don't want to feel any free play. Now when I spin the tire, it should only spin about three rotations or so and then come to a stop. That'll indicate your brakes are properly adjusted. You will hear a little sh sh as the tire goes around, completely normal. If you spin this and it comes to a stop and say a half a spin, they're over adjusted and there's something wrong inside there. So now this isn't the end of the world, doesn't mean you can't go, but it might mean that when you get back you won't have your brakes adjusted and while you're out, your brakes aren't going to be working as effectively as they could be. So while I'm spinning around looking, I'm also going to check the rim for cracks. Um, Anything abnormal, looking for rust, although these are aluminum, so that's not really going to rust. I'm basically checking everything out. So now at this point, we've given the brakes a uh, quick check, tire a quick check, and the bearings a quick check. So I'm going to lower the tire back down, and we'll do more things like check the suspension and check the air pressure. So let me do that real quick. Next thing I'm going to do is check my air pressure. I'm at 55. So. You can air these tires down when you're off-road, but if you drive on-road with aired down tires, you increase your surface area, which will build up more heat, which could lead to a blowout. So fill your tires back up right away when you hit the pavement. Lug nuts, a very important part about your pre-inspection, uh, your annual inspection, all those things. Lug nuts, very important. So I carry several tools. One is torque wrench, click style breakaway, 19 millimeter half inch drive socket, uh, a half inch drive extension and a breaker bar. The breaker bar I use I use for breaking the lug nuts loose when I'm changing the tire after I have a flat tire. I use it for loosening. The torque wrench is a calibrated uh, tool that you don't want to put undue or unneeded or unnecessary stress on like loosening lug nuts. So I would loosen the lug nuts with a breaker bar but in this case we're making sure they're tight before we go so I'm going to tighten this one to 100 foot-pounds. There's a lot of different styles and types out there, so read the directions on yours on how to do it. So, there is a bearing on here that if I press this button on the back, releases, and I, there's a hole in the saw extension. So if I line the two up, now my extension won't come off unless I press the button. So. Yeah, I can hear. I'm gonna hold the shaft, if you will, and press down. Now I could do it this way, and I could pull, but then I'm putting the excess wear and tear on my body and my back. Why not let gravity work for me? I'm gonna turn it around, and then I'm gonna hold this shaft, and I'm gonna press down on the torque wrench until the torque wrench goes click. Like that. Now we know our lug nuts are tight. They're not going to fall off on the road. The other thing you'll notice is that I went across. That's incredibly, that's mostly important or more important when you're changing the tire. Say I just put a hole in the sidewall of this tire, now it's flat, compromised in some way, and I put spare on. Put the lug nuts on by hand. I'll spin them on by hand with the socket and the extension until they're all snug. 
lower the trailer back down and then use a torque wrench to tighten them. But I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, and six so that as I tighten down, it will center the rim on the lug nuts. If you go around in a circle, there's a small likelihood that you, the rim won't center on the lug nuts properly. And even though you tighten them to the 100 foot pounds, this could still come loose. All right, so the next thing I'm going to be checking is the hitch, making sure all the bolts are snug. Also check you know, all my parts. Again, no excessive free play. This is the lock and roll hitch. Not many people know it, but there's actually a fitting right here. You need to grease every outing. So you take a needle point uh, on a grease gun and lube this. Squirt some grease in there. If you don't know what that grease gun looks like, or the needle point looks like, look down in the description. You'll find a uh, link so you can buy one or at least get a visual on what it is. That's got to be lubed. So, now this all looks good. I'm going to check my safety chains. Safety chains, a real important aspect to towing safely. I came over to a local rental yard. I apologize for the noise. I got a highway right there. I got heavy equipment back in there. And animals over there. But if you look at this one, you'll see it's been ground down by dragging. Which in California is a huge thing. We got wildland fires all the time. We've actually had some started from sparks from these things. So officers are trained to look for that. Um, there is a minimum distance, and I believe it's about two inches. You'll generally see when I get set up to tow, I run my foot along the bottom to make sure I've got some some space. Some states they really care about this problem. So they'll, especially with commercial drivers, they'll actually carry a go no go gauge, which is proper thickness and too small, unsafe to drive with. So they'll force you either give you a ticket if you're like uh, me with a regular driver's license, but if you're a commercial driver or operator, they will force you to park the load until you fix and address the problem. And you can see this one's just been dragged, dragged through everything. How worn down that is. So for now we're gonna put this back where we found it. Say thank you to the guys at the shop and head on back. Check the breakaway, make sure everything's there. Yeah. Now we're gonna inspect the frame, make sure there's no cracks, everything's good, there's no major rust. All is there. Check the wires, make sure there's no fray marks. It's all intact, the connector's clean. So we're pretty much good there. Let's move, let's move on to the next part. Now we're under the trailer. Again, I'm gonna check wiring, look for frays, look for broken insulation. Here's the parking cable. I'm gonna make sure it's in good shape too. Check both sides. Check the frame again, look for any major rusts, <laughs> corrosion, uh, <laughs> cracks. I like peppers for all the other Again, some more wiring. Oh yeah, so those, those looks pretty good. Shirt. All right, let's move on down the trailer. So how are you doing, Adam and Dylan? I'm not going too fast, doing the right speed. Good to hear. So, moving on. Not everybody knows about these, but underneath these little caps right here, on the trailing arms, the suspension, the dessert fittings. We'll take a clean rag, wipe those off, I'm going to take a grease gun with a zert fitting on the end. Stuff it on. Give it a few pumps of grease. Wipe it back off. Put the cap on. There's another one. There's two on each side. So, squirt. Oops, wasn't on there. If it comes squirting out at the zert fitting right here, it wasn't on all the way. There we go. So it's done. Again, I'm going to wipe it off. Okay, done. Cap off. Cap off. Tighten it up. Let me clean it up. Sorry. Okay. Get the other side. Okay, and take the rag and wipe it off. This is the messiest part. This is the part I don't like. Lubing this thing up. But if you keep it lubed and greased, it'll last a lot longer. You take care of your opus, your opus will take care of you.
while I'm under here, I'm going to make sure the bolts are all tight, loosey goosey springs. Let's move on back. Next, I'm going to check the shocks, make sure there's no major dents, dings, or fluids leaking. That all looks pretty good. Check the limiting strap, that's in good shape. Check any wiring, this is for the brake, make sure that's in good shape. Now that I'm under here, I can check the sidewall. Granted, it's better when it's actually up in the air. I can spin it and feel it and look at it. Again, I like the feel and the eyes. So we'll check the other side and we'll move on. Remember, these Opus trailers are designed to be used hard. They're going to need periodic maintenance, inspections, and repairs. So the more you check it out, the better, again, the better you take care of it, the better it's going to take care of you. But we're going to check the water lines. Check the other electrical lines that are underneath here. We're going all the way from the front, all the way from the front, all the way to the back. All right. Water line looks good, and gas line looks good. All right, well, we're moving on down the trailer. Let's go. Now I'm also going to check the condition of the spare tire. Same thing applies. I'm going to check for wear, tear, bulges, craters. Check the rim. This is still a brand new rim and tire that's never been used. The last thing to do is check the air pressure. Fifty-three, good to go. What you're saying right now, Dylan, that's the wrong hitch to be hooking up the Opus. We're not hitching the Opus right now, though. We're just checking the lights, so it's okay. Seven pin connector, make sure it's clean. All the pins are straight, there's nothing rocks down inside there. Plug it in. It is polarized, there's a keyway inside here. Plug it in, close it, and on this one, it's got a tab on the last so I can't pull it back out I know it's connected so now let's check the lights on the others we're gonna do a walk around right now we're just checking the running lights the license plate light I've got tail lights I've got side markers everything looks good all right let's check the next set so right about here is where I noticed the other one is not working. So I'm going to get it fixed. I'm pulling out of the... I was kind of disappointed in that one. And I also taped it with medical tape to my chest. So taking it off was painful. Left hand to move back. On our truck, a 2014 Chevy, this is our brake controller, it's integrated into the truck. So trailer brake, less trailer brake, more trailer brake, so otherwise known as your gain. Less gain, more gain. And then here is your slider, so I can apply the trailer brake without actually stepping on the brake pedal. So hypothetically the trailer starts kind of doing this behind me, I can slide this to straighten myself out. That's a good use. There's other uses for this, but that's the best one. Once I'm hooked up and ready to go, I'm going to actually put this truck in gear uh, and apply this and see, make sure that the trailer is dragging behind me. Now, I'm not going to make it like, you know, squealing tires, drag it 100 feet. I'm just going to go a foot or two, and this will tell me if the uh, trailer brakes are actually physically working. And I don't have to floor it all the way down, you know, just like the brake pedal doesn't have to go all the way down. I'm just going to give it enough to where I know that I can feel the trailer 
pulling the truck backwards. I hope this isn't strobing too bad, but if you, on this truck, when you, when I step on the brake pedal, it shows me how much power is being applied to the trailer itself. So I've got a pretty good amount of pressure on the brake pedal in the truck right now, showing it's putting out a fair amount of voltage to the, uh, uh, the magnet inside the brakes of the trailer, applying the brakes. And as I let off, it goes away. And then every vehicle is going to be different, so I can't really tell you, okay, it's just paired with my phone. Oops. I can't really tell you what numbers are best for you because your vehicle is going to be unique. But I've run all the way from down from three up to five, depending on where my terrain and where I'm at. So I think when I got in here it was at 4.0 though. The other thing, uh, this is the default setting you always see in our truck right now. My compass, which is not too important. Outside temperature matters to me, but this transmission temperature, critical thing to know when you're towing. It doesn't matter what you're towing. Um, this truck is rated to pull 17,000 pounds, uh, but if you start towing, say, the Opus uh, off-road, you're maybe going to be doing 15 or 20. You're not getting the same airflow over the cooling system you are on the freeway. So even though the Opus is only 35, 3,600 pounds, I've seen this get as high as 200 degrees because I'm only doing 10 miles an hour up a really steep hill. I think, I don't know like how to do the, uh, like you see the road signs, but almost one to one. I've taken this Opus up some steep stuff. And when you're going 15 miles an hour, you're not getting much cooling over your transmission. So make sure you check your, uh, keep an eye on this and check your, uh, your what would it be? manufacturer's recommendation for the maximum temperature at which you should pull over. Next, but certainly not least, is going to be a bit of check the gas connections, make sure they're snug, and check the hose to make sure it's not starting to chat and crack. Connection's tight. Sometimes inside here, the O-ring inside it starts to crack, it'll leak gas. I read a lot of comments on people having uh, their propane sensor go off. Uh, check that gasket. There's also one inside the tank. So that's the O-ring I'm saying to check. Two. So make sure they're both in good condition. Keep them snug so you keep the dust out while you're driving. This tank is strapped down. I'm going to make sure it's good and secure. It's shaking the trailer so I know I'm good to go. Alright Adam, Dylan, how was that? It wasn't too much too quick I hope? Alright, good to know. Alright, see you guys later. Bye bye. Alright, and with that, we're going to turn this volume down, turn this volume up, and uh, the video is basically it. So we, I tried to cover as much as I could, but I couldn't cover everything and every little detail. So at this point, Adam and I have some little notes we'll go over, and then um, we'll go over the, the live stream questions. So if you have some, please feel free to type them in. Um, I hope my audio is better. Uh, Opus 2 in September. Well, uh, I go out all the time to the Mendo Forest, so if you ever want to follow along, please hit me up. Um, I hope my audio is better. Um, the one question I've seen here, I did respond to, I typed, it uh, was asking about, um, thank you, a great video, I appreciate that. Um, that fa The brake controller you're seeing in the video was factory installed. It came with the truck the day it was uh, bought. Uh, personally, I think it's the best way to go. I have had an older truck where the brake controller was the aftermarket one. I liked it, but I kind of like having it factory because I can, you know, see the display from the dashboard and actually know how much voltage is being applied to the magnet inside the brakes. The magnet uh, is actually what hits the, the the vertical surface in the drum and causes friction and actually causes the shoes to open up and apply uh, braking force to the tra the the braking tra ah, braking force to the trailer itself. Um, so, Adam, let me give you a chance to speak. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, your, obviously your Opus will come with a brake controller installed, um, depending on what you tow, um, you may have to get a brake controller installed. Most, most vehicles nowadays that are at least full-size trucks come with, come with that, but I don't know what you're towing the OP2 with. Um, great choice on the Opus, by the way, I have an OP2 as well. <laughs> love it. That's what I want. I love seeing other OP2s out there. You, you don't see them very often. So that's very cool to hear. Um, yeah, I think uh, 
I guess maybe with that question, we can maybe talk a little bit about break gain. Um, depending on, you, you've kind of touched on the video, you know, depending on, on what terrain you're in. Um, if you're in sand, you want to you want to back off the break gain quite a bit because you don't want your your trailer tires locking up if you need to hit the brakes. Right, because they, they would dig in. That. I don't have a lot of experience yeah, with they, sand, so I, I'm you're teaching yeah. me here. They will, and even with gravel roads, you want to. I, in in my experience, you want to turn your brake gain, gain down as well, um, because if you hit uh, washboards or uh, things like that going around a turn mm -hmm. um, in the mountains, if your brake gain is turned up, um, you, your brakes will will want to lock up because it's it's not necessarily sensing the road. So it's um, normally I run like on my, I have a half ton uh, GMC truck on the highway. I run about 3.5 to four. Um, as soon as I get off road, I'm usually going down from there. Um, but yeah, using the slider um, is a great way to, to tell how your vehicle, how your trailer is going to react um, in those conditions. Also and, using the, uh, the slider, uh, one example, as I point out, is um, if you start to get sway. So hypothetically, you have like, I, was, I think it's the Opus 4 or like say the 15, let's go big. And your weight is not 50 50 so left to right driver's side passenger side if you have like 60 40 your trailer will start to wander behind you um i used to tow a tiny house on a regular basis and it was like 75 25 and above 50 55 it'd get really really bad and there were a couple times i actually had to use that slider because it was so bad you could feel it move in the back of the truck i'd use the slider instead of the brake pedal and that would pull everything tight and slow me down safely whereas if i just hit the brake pedal my chances are it might push harder on the truck if I don't have the brake gain correct. And the next thing I know, it's just getting exponentially worse and leading to catastrophe. So um, thought I'd throw that in there. So I guess um, I was my, my list of stuff that I would like to point out is kind of going from the front to back for the most part. Sure. Um, and you had mentioned... Um, it's okay to twist your chains up a little bit if they're dragging. Um, definitely cross your chains when towing. Yeah, so an um, X pattern. And do you want to explain why? Yeah. Well, in my opinion, it's it's because of when you, if you do have a breakaway from your, your tow vehicle, that mm -hmm. it will pull tight um, sooner and faster than if they're just hanging straight on each side. It also, I think, keeps the trailer more in line with the tow vehicle if the, if the chains are crossed instead of straight out mm -hmm. it can it has a lot more free play to do this so you the one other thing uh, i would mention is you have a chance if you have the x pattern there's a chance that when if they're properly adjusted that when your trailer comes on hitch god forbid you don't want that to happen that the tongue will actually catch on that x and hold it off of the pavement um, that's if the chains are properly tightened and whatnot and uh, there's a lot of variables in that, but that's another hope is that they'll catch the tongue and it will, you know, dive in. And if it hits a pothole, whoa, we, we won't even go there. So. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I noticed in your video, and I have the same thing, is a, a carabiner hooked up to the brake cable. Mm -hmm. um, instead of the hooking it on. The breakaway cable? Yes. Okay. Yes, the breakaway cable. Um, instead of hooking it on something else or trying to figure out that's the easiest way. Just make sure you get it strong one. Mm -hmm. um, and he's rated for the poundage. Um, but it's a super easy, secure way to attach it to your actual, um, what I do is I, I run my brake cable um, through the same hole as where I have my, my uh, trailer chains hooked up. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot easier than trying to figure out where you're going to hook the cable and it might not be the most secure place. Um, so that's kind of a thing that I've always done with my trailers is use a carabiner on your, on your, uh, breakaway cable. Yeah. And the one I have in the video is actually over a kill, but it's what I had in, you know, on hand. 
and I'd rather have it yeah. too big than too too light duty. The other thing I would mention is that you can go over the receiver. Uh, that works too. Uh, it, if you need to take up a little bit more cable, if you say have too much cable, you can go over the top of the receiver and back down. That's perfectly acceptable too. Um, the other thing to mention is if your break cable, your break away cable is too long, it's okay to tie a loose knot in it to take up some of the slack because you're not compromising the integrity of the cable. It only takes like five pounds to pull it out. It's not very much, maybe 10. I've never actually measured it. It doesn't take a lot though. So if your breakaway cable is too long, you can tie a loose knot in it. Uh, and I uh, and would emphasize the loose because what if you decide to tow it with your buddy struck or you decide to sell it later on and it's suddenly not long enough. And if you put a nice tight knot in there, you're gonna have trouble getting it out. Plus it looks weird when you take it out. Even if you did get it, you'd have this little kink in there. Um, the other thing to emphasize is do not weave it through your chains. I see that time countless times. People weave it through the chain because it keeps it you know, out of the way and it looks pretty and whatever. You're completely defeating the purpose of having that breakaway cable. You want it independent of the, um, the, the seven pin connector and the two chains. You want them the two chains, like we said, X pattern, your seven pin connector. And then if you need to, I have seen people drape it over the wire for the seven pin connector to help hold it up there. Uh, and I have seen people do one loop around that, but again, you want to kind of keep it loose because if that trailer breaks away, the idea is that there's a little battery in the brake controller box on the trailer. That brake con controller gets pulled away. There's two contacts that connect and basically apply voltage to the magnet inside the brakes, locking up the brakes. So if your trailer comes disconnected, instead of gliding down the freeway, the brakes lock up. And it's going to make a lot of smoke and mess up your tires and this and that, but it's going to come to a stop and be less likely to hurt somebody or property. So again, it, that's basically what the breakaway cable is for. Um, I have seen people yank the breakaway cable as like an anti-theft thing. Problem with that is you're applying voltage to the brakes and it doesn't take very long for the battery to go dead. <laughs> so you'll have to buy a new battery or a new brake controller. So I don't recommend that. I guess if you were in a pinch and only gonna be gone for a couple of minutes, not a big deal. Nobody's, def nobody's gonna steal it because the brakes are locked, but um, emphasizing keeping the brake controller uh, breakaway cable loose and on its own little plane. But again, you don't want too much slack because if it snags on a branch and comes undone, well then you pray you didn't, you know, if it pops out, you can't put it back in, but if it breaks off, then you're in a whole nother world of problems. So turn it back. Yeah, and I'll also, mention, I'll also mention too, that it is, it is the law in almost every state um, that you have a, a, a brake controller um, on the trailer and on the, on the tow vehicle. Um, some states, it can vary with how much weight you're towing. Mm -hmm. um, but almost every state that I've seen, the Opus qualifies that it would fall in the category where it is the law to have um, a breakaway on the brake controller on the trailer and a brake system on your vehicle for the trailer. So... so we just got asked a question here to, I guess, go a little more in depth. Uh, I'm confused about the breakaway cable. Can you please explain what it is, what it does, and a proper way to attach it and connect it? So maybe what I should do is jump online and see if I can find a picture of it and see if I can share it. Um, so give me one second here. Um, oops. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Breakaway cable images. Yeah, I would definitely not recommend, like Dylan said, um, weaving the the cable through the chains. You want to keep that free. So I think I found an image. Come on now, give me this enlarged photo. Okay, so let me share this. We go, I think here. That's not working. Why is it not working? Okay, bear with me. I thought this was all set up, but uh, we'll just take a second. And if not, we'll just uh, try and explain it. Or actually, the other way to do it would be to video, media source, here, uh, loop. So cancel. So we're showing the video over again. And on the top of this, you can see the cable and the breakaway c controller on the Opus. And in just a moment here, I'll hook it up and you'll get some better idea. Fortunately, I cannot pause this, so we're kind of limited. Um, but the breakaway controller you're seeing here uh, is connected to the braking system. And if that cable you see right there 
gets it can be pulled out with little very little force will pull out from that little black box and if it pulls out from that little black box the battery inside the brake controller on the trailer will apply full voltage to the magnet inside the brakes and lock them up so that if you come disconnected the trailer will lock the tires up and not go freewheeling down the freeway so here you can see a little bit better view of the breakaway cable in just a moment you'll see me hook it up to the receiver but um, you can see the receiver over here in the corner you can run it up and over the receiver and underneath or through this portion where in the receiver where you run the chains either way is completely acceptable um, they're both very strong because this cable is very thin and does not take much uh, effort to pull it free that's kind of the idea so we'll wait just a moment here I can't scrub through but that's one of the next few things um, but again, I've seen people weave this little cable through these chains and that completely defeats the purpose because the the chains are going to snap and the chains or the cable is going to break and it's not going to pull that pin out of that little black box. There's a little pin right here that runs horizontal and it's not if you take that cable, you can pull it out and uh, test it yourself if you want to and then just stick it back in there. Um, you again you can pull it out momentarily you're not going to hurt anything and just slide it back in so you have some idea so here I'm about to hook it up you'll get some idea there you go and then there's that piece we're talking about little carabiner you want to make sure that is stronger than your cable see it's looped and then I'm just going to run the cable underneath to give it a little more elevation but it's not wrapped around anything the only thing it's wrapped around right here is the receiver so if it breaks away, it breaks away. And then there I'm showing you my foot underneath it. I hope that gives you some better sense of what's going on. Um, so we'll go back here. Um, and that should be done playing, I hope. So I hope that answers your question. If not, please feel free to type it in. We'll go deeper in as deep as we can. Um, Adam, do you got more comments? I mean, I got a whole list. I've been taking notes during the video. <laughs> Um, yeah, let me get back into my notes really quick. Um, I guess moving back from that, from the hitch itself, um, is I always perform a heat test on my hubs um, every time I stop. Um, anytime I stop for gas, for snacks, for a bathroom break, any of that. And it's super simple to do. And um, I'll even do it after you know, right after I've changed to new bearings because you're already walking around the trailer anyways. So all you do is um, walk around to both hubs, the center cap on your on your wheel um, and just feel it. If it's super hot to the touch, your wheel bearings are um, possibly not in the greatest of shape. It can change with ambient temperature so if it is 105 degrees out in your towing they're going to be they're going to be pretty hot um but in, even if you feel like the center cap on your truck um when it's that hot it's going to be it's going to be pretty warm but on normal towing temperatures if you're in like the 70s to 80s that should just be kind of warm to the touch um if if you can't hold your hand on that for any amount of time, really, um, unless it's super hot outside, you may have a bearing, a wheel bearing issue that you may want to address um, and have it looked at. But it just kind of depends on um, what conditions your trailer are in, um, how much you're off-roading it. Um, is it in really dusty conditions? Is it in really rough roads? I had my my bearings changed at about 5,000 miles last time and there was no issues. Um, they were in great shape. Um, and I actually had Opus do it for me. I took it to the factory and they, they did a full inspection on it. And uh, there, was, there was no issues with the wheel bearing. So that kind of gives me an idea of about what you're looking at for a time frame. Um, but again, there can be, you can get bearings replaced in your trailer and they could be bearings that aren't the, the highest quality or they're just a faulty bearing. So mm -hmm. it's, it's still good to do periodic maintenance and, and check your wheel bearings, um, and 
make sure that uh, you're not having any heat issues or like Dylan was pointing out in the video, the wobbling of the tire. Um, yeah, the wobbling of the tire. If I, if I, the, um, the I just did a live stream uh, that was it was a live stream because I was having a issues with the wheel bearings were that's too much free play so i did a live stream of me actually lifting the trailer up checking the bearings and completely disassembling the all the bearings the seals and showing you how to check their condition um how uh, talk about the seals everything so if you want to check that out and it's extremely thorough it's pretty long it's about an hour and a half but i do both sides of the trailer and go over all four bearings i go over the seals uh the cotter pins the grease everything so you can check in my previous live streams and see that if you want to. But I'm also working with Opus. I was talking to them today. Uh, we're going to be starting a YouTube channel and trying to work together to just flood it with content of like things to know, things that are, you know, uh, we were talking about, I guess, some like the heaters have been changed, knowing to be able to change out what heater for what model. Um, this, this video about towing, I'm going to be redoing and doing instead of a live stream, doing a uh, making sure my audio is a little better, <laughs> but making it more concise, a little more precise. So please feel free to stay tuned to that. Uh, probably subscribe and I'll notify you as soon as that channel is up and running. Um, the thing I wanted to add about uh, the temperature on the bearings Adam was talking about was uh, the, the rule I've always uh, applied to myself is if you're on, when you're towing, if you're on the brakes as much as you're off the brakes, you're on them too much. So when it comes to heat, that's something to remember. Um, and I already mentioned the video about the wheel bearings. So I have, and the thing I would also add about wheel bearings is Adam is completely right. You can buy low quality bearings and you can buy high quality bearings. In my area, we actually have a bearing and hydraulic shops. There's several of them here in Sonoma County. That's all they sell is hydraulic hoses and bearings. So if you go in there with your bearing and say, hey, I have this and I want your best of the best they will help you order them whereas if you go to like napa or autozone yes they will measure them and they will fit and they will work but you won't get something as good as if you went to a place that only deals with bearings and hydraulics so that's some food for thought right there and you can also if if you don't want to um do the the, the extra work like dylan was talking about and going out and finding your own bearings opus has them in stock um they carry them in stock you can easily contact Sarah and um, they can they can ship you the bearings and seals if you want to do those repairs yourself. So um, I have a order a set on order from Opus and when they yeah. arrive, I will be showing you how to uh, unbox the bearings or take the whole assembly apart, clean everything, unbox the bearings and pack them with grease and reassemble the entire attachment. It's actually not that hard to replace your bearings and pack them. But to be honest, it's one of the more dirty and disgusting parts of the Opus. It probably is actually the most disgusting because the grease gets everywhere. Even with gloves, yeah. it still gets absolutely everywhere. So it may not be a repair you actually want to do. And it is one of those things that you do want to do correctly because if you, you can over tighten them and under tighten them pretty easily. But again, it's not that hard. I will be putting out a video very soon, more likely a live stream, because I am I have a set of bearings on order from Opus. And to be clear, I'm when I was talking about a bearing and hydraulic shop, I'm not saying Opus does not sell good parts. Um, I'm I have this is my first experience with Opus. I've only had the Opus light for what a month and a half, um, so I know very little about them. I'm just saying that if you're in some other town and you need to get bearings, that would be something to consider and have the peace of mind of knowing that you're getting really good stuff is go to a bearing hydraulic shop. Um, Adam, we got another question about the, the breakaway cable. So the important thing to make is to make sure the cable is somehow attached to the tow vehicle. Yes. So you can run it through either the, where you would attach the chains or up and over the entire receiver. Uh, second part of the question, uh, it's so that if it come uh, is in the case of unhitching, that's correct. It's in case of the absolute worst case scenario that the the hitch comes apart or I'll do respect whoever I'm speaking to forgot to lock it correctly, whether it's the DO35 or the lock and roll. Um, somehow the thing came apart and then the chains broke on top of that, which is you're more likely to get struck by lightning or attacked by a shark or whatever else sensationalistic I can think of um, than have it actually 
that happen. But if it does happen where it comes unhitched, your chains break, the last resort is that cable pulls out from that black box and the, the wheels will lock up on the trailer and hopefully it will glide over to the side. Well, that's the hope anyway. It's not likely it's going to. But at least it's going to come to a stop and not just keep going down the freeway. Um, yes, the, the last part of the question is it will pull from the black box. Again, if you want to try it out, grab that where the cable where it connects to the little black pin that goes into the black box, pull on it and take it out and see what happens. Uh, I mean, you're, you'll notice the wheels will lock up and then reinsert it. Just remember which orientation it came out in, but it'll only go in one way. You can pull it out and stick it back in there just for your own reference of how much effort it takes to remove it and what happens try pulling it out and then try pushing your trailer it won't go anywhere and then stick it back in there and you're good to go so um sorry to sidetrack you adam uh and by all means please keep dropping in the questions that's what we're here for we're doing our best to we want to make sure that you tow safely uh, and have uh you know you take care of your opus it'll take care of you i mentioned that in the video um but the main thing is that you're safe and you're you're safe and everybody around you is safe so um next comment adam uh, go ahead <laughs> um i guess one thing that i thought of and i hadn't really thought of it before um until i saw the op light that you're towing dylan which is maybe coming with the newer models and if that's the case then the heat test may not work so well but unless you take the hubcaps off but the OP light has the hubcap, and I don't know if that's because it's a. Uh, now I'm. I'm I've got the fancy the rims. <laughs> yeah, if it's a, if it's the prototype, or if that's what they're going with now, but make sure those are tight if you have them. No, I noticed, yeah. you know, when we got up to Walmart, yes. the hubcaps were loose, and we had enough tools. It was just a, a simple Allen wrench to tighten them down, but. Um, those kind of things when you're off-roading stuff will get loosened up i mean nothing is fail proof um especially when can... you drive it off road <laughs> it yeah, doesn't matter if you won't. bought top shelf air compressor top shelf shocks and wheel bearings and tires stuff is gonna break <laughs> it's gonna bend yeah. it's gonna leak um it's gonna come loose so hence the like uh, I, I, adam you watch the forums more than i do but I'm constantly seeing people like, hey, is this normal? Is that normal? Well, there may be some things that slip past somebody during some sort of inspection. But remember, like if you drive it anywhere near what I do, I'm, I'm doing one to one slopes. I'm going through river beds like I, I'm taking this Opus light everywhere. And like Adam was saying, actually, I have the uh, Opus's uh, prototype of the light. I'm taking it a lot of places and I'm driving it really, really hard. That means that the harder I drive it, the more I have to inspect it, the more I got to lube it, the more I got to check for loose this and that, broken or, or misaligned. It's going to happen. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Your, drive, your truck is going to, or van or whatever you're driving, needs the same kind of care and maintenance. These things are designed to be used hard, but also taken well care of and inspected on occasion because that's just some extreme abuse. Sorry to go on a rant there. <laughs> no, it's true. I think that that's that's part of the uh pre-towing inspection um is take the time to get underneath your trailer and and look at all the bolts make sure there's no bolts missing from anywhere um because there are there are bolts and things under there that um you should be checking even if it's just with a just with your hand to make sure they're not completely loose um there's there's things under the trailer that uh bolts and screws and even inside the trailer that uh, it's not a bad idea once in a while just to take a few minutes um, before your trip or when you're preparing for your trip and and just kind of go over the trailer and make sure all the bolts and screws and all those things are tight because you're better off to find it then than on the trail. Absolutely. And you have a bolt that was loose and it fell out and now you're in a position where you're in the middle of a trail somewhere and there's not going to be a parts store anywhere around so you're better off to find it when you're at home where there's a parts store within 10 minutes of you than 100 miles so uh, preventative the, maintenance yeah the, the other thing i want to stress is that not everybody knows about lubing the hitch 
Uh, I don't know much about the Dio 35. I've been begging to get one, but apparently they're worth their weight in gold right now. So <laughs> I'm not getting one anytime soon. Um, but the lock and roll does have that zert. Or it's not a zert fitting. The grease fitting. You need to lube that every outing. And then underneath the, on the, uh, the trailing arms, there's the two zert fittings on either side. Those have to be lubed every outing also. Otherwise, you're going to get premature wear, uh, friction f and failure. But also, you're going to start getting squeaks and noises that are just obnoxious. So grease them. Uh, I've said this a couple of times. If you have any question as to what tools to buy or whatever, support this channel and check out the links down below in the description. Uh, the grease guns in there, the grease, there's a link to grease, the torque wrench, the uh, socket for the lug, lug nuts, the extension. It's all down in there and it's does me a huge favor because I don't get paid except for the use of the trailer. There's no monetary value in this exchange. So um, just to plug myself. There's also, away. I'll make the point too, that there's also a grease shirt on the receiver side of the hitch. Um, mine has a plug. I'm not sure why. Oh, I asked about mine, that and they're like, oh, it might break off. But my, Yeah, my lock and roll had a, had a uh, grease shirt on the, on the receiver side where it rotates into your truck. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mine has well, a, maybe cap. it doesn't, maybe, it, maybe not, but that's one thing to at least check for and see if there's another, I can't remember if it was a, a needle fitting or if it was just a regular zerk, but there was a, a grease zerk on that, on that, on the truck side of the hitch. So. so I don't know if I got a used hitch or an abused hitch or receipt, uh, you know, the, the end that goes to the truck. I don't know if I got one, you know, how, what condition it was in before I used it. Um, but it does have, it's capped off with a nut, but I have been, to be honest, tempted to take that out. Cause you just need a small box end wrench, super simple. And then thread in a zert fitting. So again, super simple, probably yeah, I mean, you'd spend more in gas to drive to the store to buy the zert fitting. <laughs> yeah. There should be one there because that's an articulation point. You'd think. Um, I can't so, speak. I mean, if that, if that's the receiver side of the hitch is turning, you know, left and right, um, it's it can have heat build up in there, and so that there should be a there should be a zerk on the on the truck side. So, well, there we um, go. So when we're done with the live stream uh, tomorrow, I'm going to the store and I'm buying a zerk fitting. So there we go. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't have a zerk yeah. fitting on your lock and roll hitch. On the truck side, consider buying one. You know, to be honest, the I, I might consider if it were mine, uh, changing out the um, pin fitting on the trailer end where it pivots this way um, for an actual zert fitting. Apparently, they didn't use a zert because it might shear off, which I totally get and respect. But the convenience of having the same thing on all what, two in the four in the back, two on the hit, that's six points, not having to change out tips. That, it's kind of nice. So I'll probably end up changing would, it out if when I get permission. Would a regular Zert fitting though, um, when it, because the Zert fitting is on the side of the, I would call it the T-bar, right? Mm -hmm. Wait, T-bar, it would be more location of the trailer. Are you talking about the axles or the... Oh, the, um, the, the you have your, your solid hitch that comes off the tongue of the trailer and mm -hmm. then you have the bolt that comes through and mm -hmm. your swivel point. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, a T-bar that drops into your hitch. Mm -hmm. That, that, um, uh, needle fitting is on the side is there enough clearance to put a greaser in there without when it articulates left and right would it yes would it hit it would, there not, it would not break you know you'd have to okay. my truck my taillights would break before i hit that which is a whole nother little like picture i want to like take is take my truck out into a field and just get it you know fly the drone above looking straight down and see how far i can uh, how much angle i can get between the two just out of curiosity and i know others are right. curious about it too but of course it's going to vary by vehicle uh so yeah it's kind of a hard thing but i'd like to at least know and no my bigger concern would be snagging that zert fitting on something or rock hitting it but you know again convenience i don't think it's a major issue but uh it's not my equipment so i'm not going to change it out but if it were my equipment uh i would change it out to all zert fittings everything Um, the other thing I going back to the hubcaps, um, I don't see, I'm still learning all the different models, but the hubcaps, the, the point I might bring up is if you're in heavy mud often or driving it through rivers, um, note that that will trap, uh, water and mud and debris, which could prematurely cause your dust caps on the wheel bearings to rust. 
So just another little thing I'd, I'd weigh, you know, weigh or what kind of driving you're doing. If it's just dirt roads and whatnot and you know, driving down the freeway in the rain, not a big deal. But if you're constantly going through muddy conditions or constantly through river crossings, you might want to take the hubcaps off because they will retain the mud and the moisture. They, and they're not going to yeah. happen on one trip. It's probably going to happen, you know, instead of lasting uh, 15 years, it might be eight. Just to be clear, it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah, and I haven't even paid attention. That's one thing I haven't looked at with new owners on on the group to pay attention to their wheels and see if there's actual an actual uh hub cap like just the the small steel like you were showing in your video which is after he takes the hub cap off there's that steel retainer or i guess it's like aluminum um or uh, some kind of lighter weight material that goes over top of the hub um and i haven't paid attention to see if if new trailers are coming that way or if there's an actual plastic hubcap that's screwed on over top of the whole hub assembly. So, uh, yeah, that's it's, something I'll have to check and see. It's going to be interesting because it seems like uh, Opus is listening to and watching and reading all of the forums and, and groups and whatnot. Um, but with the supply chains and, uh, you know, having issues, it'll be interesting to see what they adapt uh, between the two, the, you know, what they come up with and ideas. And, um, the other thing I wanted to stress real quick that I almost forgot about was in the video, I talk about feeling the tires. I think the visual and touching is they're equally as important. Um, sometimes you won't see something, but you'll feel it. So I'll generally spin the tire and look at the tread, spin the tire, feel the tread, and then spin the tire, look at the sidewall inside, and then spin the tire and feel the sidewall outside or inside and also do the uh, inside and out. So uh, I think it's really important to use your hands and your eyes for both of those. And then I don't know if you got uh, want to elaborate on that or you got another point you want to go over of something from the video. No, I, that's, I mean, I've, I've done the same thing and, and um, there was a circumstance where I was, I was, doing the exact same thing you're talking about. It was actually when I worked at a, a dealership doing oil changes and tire rotations and things like that. But I had visually inspected the tire and I didn't see anything. And I was spinning the tire, feeling the sidewall. There was actually a, a like a drywall screw <sighs> that was a darker color that was in the side of the tire, but the head was broken off. So you couldn't, you couldn't necessarily, necessarily see it, but when you had your hand sliding over it, you could feel that that rough edge of that mm -hmm. screw going over the palm of your hand. So it was a great indication to me that there was something going on with the side of that tire. And after looking at it a little closer, after feeling that rough spot, I found the, the screw and was able to fix their tire for them instead of them having a flat tire later. So that's a good example of why that's important to do it leads me to something i didn't put in the in the description was a tire plug kit that's pretty they're really small very inexpensive yeah. and can save your bottom <laughs> so uh i'll add that to the description later on and uh it again if you get something you know i've seen guys use four or five plugs to fill big holes and it it won't get you across the country but it'll get you back into town um yeah and can save your backside real quick. Um, more? Do you want me to go? <laughs> this is all, it's not scripted, by the way. So, um, I guess two things, two other things. I think on the tires. Um, I think for for, and I should have I should have brought my op, my OP two manual in here, but I have the Opus sent me the new manual for the newly released. OP2s, which is a little different than mine, but as far as maintenance goes, it's going to be the same. And I believe it was checking torque um, up for the first 500 miles. Mm, yes. And then checking torque every 2,000 miles after that. On the lug nuts. Um, right. On Just the lug to nuts. be clear, what part and we're talking about. Also, um, check the lug nut, check the torque on your spare tire. Uh, make sure that that's set to 100 foot pounds too, because you don't want your spare tire falling off <laughs> when you're off-roading. And I mean, for me, I don't, 
I can't even see my spare tire so on my trailer. So if I because I have the, the rack on the on the roof, so if I lost my spare tire, I wouldn't even know until <laughs> the next time I got out of my truck and I walk back there and I have no spare. That could be so, really bad. Yeah, that, that could be really bad. So that's another thing to make sure and they're supposed to be torqued to hundred foot pounds as well. Mm -hmm. Uh the spare tire. So that's another thing to make sure and check when you're doing your your tire inspection and, and checking uh, torque on all your tires, check your spare tire as well. Absolutely. Uh, I had forgotten about the rechecking them after the, you know, the, the, the break-in period. Um, the other thing I, I just realized is that you can do, if you're at the gas station filling up and you want to check the bearings, it will only tell you if they're like really, really bad condition. You don't have to lift the trailer up. You can actually grab it at 12 o'clock with both hands and push rather aggressively in and out. And if there's, enough free play that you should really be concerned you'll feel it doing that when you lift the tire up you can feel small amounts of free play and that's when it's good to address it because you're at home and you you have the tools and the the shops around you and whatnot to fix it but if you're you know on a long long road trip it wouldn't hurt you every you know a couple thousand miles while you're filling up grab that top of the tire and be more aggressive with it and shove it in and out and you'll feel that dum, 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 if there's a major problem that you need to get addressed. You won't feel the minor like it's just starting, but the gross problems, for lack of a better phrase. Um, so I let's see. I'm, I'm just kind of going over my notes here. Um, the other thing I wanted to 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 talk about was the breaker bar and the um, torque wrench hold it with one the shaft the the shaft of the lug nut or the, the 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 extension and the socket hold that stable while you push down don't just push down because the whole thing will wrench and you can uh strip the lug not strip the lug nut but damage parts in there hold one and torque the other the other one is i've seen guys <laughs> i saw this once at a tire shop guy free spun the tire and then yanked on the torque wrench <laughs> like no Go slow and steady wins the race. Slow and steady until it goes click. You don't want to go sharp, jet, uh, you know, do a um, pull. You're not going to get an accurate reading and an accurate set of your lug nuts. Slow and steady. So I, I told the manager, I'm like, dude, look what the guy's doing. He's like, oh. <laughs> like, that's all kinds of bad. Um, there are other styles of torque wrenches out there. There are digital versions. And then there's another one that the... The main shaft actually bows and there's an indicator that stays parallel and then there's a graph you can read as it goes it change it tells you what you're at but that i only like those if i'm doing like inch pounds or something like torque on a head gasket but um you can get the torque wrenches in a digital version and not the the, the, the one i'm using in the video you have anything you want to add on those uh, oh breaker bar for remove again emphasizing removing the lug nuts with a breaker bar not the torque wrench don't do that <laughs> Um, let's see here. So the other thing that we did talk about a couple times in the video, or I did uh, once before, I'll talk about it again in my, my first person, I guess. Um, make sure your chains are off the ground because it's a fire hazard, it's a safety hazard, and the cops do actually carry a go no-go gauge that tells them the proper uh, size the chain is supposed to be, and they can go around it and then flip it around. And if it's undersized, again, if you're a commercial driver, you're stuck. You cannot go anywhere until you fix it, and you're probably going to get a ticket. Uh, if you're like me and not a commercial driver, you're still likely to get a ticket and or probably told to get off the freeway. And it, I, I would imagine if you continue to do it, there might be some other consequences. Um, so yeah, I I am a I am a commercial driver, so I, that everything that happens to a normal person is like tenfold for me. So that's where I've learned to. Um, do all these pre-checks before I drive. Uh, I was taught that. So, um, and it's very important to me because even if I'm in my personal vehicle, even if I'm towing the Opus down the highway and I get pulled over for speeding, it's like twice as bad for me than it is for a normal driver. So um, I do I have a lot of experience with all these pre-checks and, and towing. So yeah. It's important, and and like like Dylan was saying, that's probably one of the number one causes of of or one of the highest higher rated causes of fires is people towing, and 
flat tires on their on even on their just their personal vehicle which causes a spark tire chains causing a spark mm -hmm. you see that all the time I, I don't know how many times i've read a forest fire started by someone towing or just driving and, and having a, a blowout and causing a spark mm -hmm. or chains dragging and causing a spark and starts a forest fire you don't want to be that guy so it's better to do a good maintenance check on your trailer and a, kind of like a pre-drive inspection or pre-tow inspection before you get out there than um, neglecting on doing some of those things and and you end up having a big bill at the end of the day not just for your trailer but possibly from cal fire uh, <laughs> Forest Service cal fire yeah yeah all kinds of bad all kinds of bad yeah. um the other one I have, and I, I, I preach this all the time. You hear it from me all the time, Adam. Sorry about this, but it's not necessarily a safety thing as much as a vehicle thing. Monitor your transmission temperature. Transmit heat is the transmission's worst enemy. So if you're towing with like a Tacoma or something, it's even more important. You can buy from Amazon, all these other stores, uh, a little device that plugs into your OBD2. Uh, it's underneath the uh, driver's side dashboard, or it's supposed to be within two feet of the driver. You plug it in there. It connects via Bluetooth to your phone or your tablet, and you can monitor pretty much anything on the vehicle. Uh, but transmission is incredibly important, especially when you're going slow. Like I was saying last night that last time I was out, I was doing one-to-one -one slopes uphill that were like two or three miles long. I'm doing five, 10, maybe 15 miles an hour. And even though I'm driving a diesel three quarter ton truck, there's almost no air flowing over the cooling system. So I'm running at 200 degrees. 230 is where I need to pull over. So I'm really pretty close to that. Granted, it was 100 degrees outside. so. It's to be expected to be that hot, but again, check your transmission temperature. So, um, Adam, more? <laughs> um, so, just going over a few uh, different things. Uh, your, the framing for your spare tire. Um, that thing is back when you're off-roading, that thing is back there doing this. I mean, there's no way around it. Um, it's really well built, but it's still constantly just the the weight of the spare tire is doing this so when you do your periodic ins inspection it doesn't have to be every time you go out but once in a while just look at your uh spare tire framing and make sure that there's on my op2 there's a couple uh bolts underneath that are tightened down to hold the actual spare tire frame to the frame of the opus um so check make sure those are tight um, I think the, the new models and even the OP4s are a little different because the, the spare tire drops down. Mine is stable on the back of the trailer, but check the framing and make sure there's no, no cracks, um, no loose bolts, uh, no loose nuts, anything like that, because that, that spare tire, when you're getting after it off-road and you're in some... <laughs> up, uh, that thing, that's just taking a beating back there. It and it doesn't matter really how well built it is mm -hmm. there's no way to secure it that it's not going to have some vibration going on back there so mm -hmm. and that's another thing you don't want to lose your spare tire when you're on yeah. the trail so. even the best grade eight bolts under the right circumstances uh you know with enough you know rattling back and forth back and forth they're gonna fail over time granted it's a really yep. long time but we're going over anything that's plausible um, right. Not to say it's going to happen, but it's plausible it could happen. So um, just things to consider, things to check out. It's not it's not a hard thing to do. And like Adam said, it doesn't matter if the best metals used and the best welder is done, uh, the best welders used to put all the joints together and the right drill press to drill the holes the right bit with a, a lots of oil to keep it lubed, it could still fail if you're driving these things as they're designed to be driven. Um, a lot of people are driving them on pavement. That's fine, but there's some people that are driving them down riverbeds. <clears throat> Not gonna say any names. Um, that's a lot of stress, and like Adam was saying, you're going over those rocks. It's 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 on a lever basically, so it's actually uh, you know multiply force multiplied, and it gets even worse. Um, sticking with the same kind of checking for cracks. Um, one thing I do periodically. I don't do it every trip, but I will crawl under the trailer. Um, and just check the overall frame condition. Uh, make sure that there's no cracks or anything going on underneath the frame. Um, that 
you may find. Um, I've done the, my inspection several times. And I've never come across any issues with the frame, but you're, if it's kind of the same thing, you're better off safe than sorry. So mm -hmm. um, that's one thing to check is just check the overall condition of the frame of the trailer because that's basically what's holding the whole thing together. So, um, and like we've talked again and again, these, these trailers are off-road. Um, if there's a, a crack and you don't notice it and you get way back in there and you're doing some, some rough off-roading, it could make it even worse. So mm -hmm. um, always a good thing to check. And that's, that's something that I don't check every time but I do check it probably once every two to three trips. I'll crawl underneath there and just kind of inspect the frame and inspect all the welds and make sure everything is um, looking the way it's supposed to. And the more you do that, and that this goes with um, all these inspections that we're talking about, the more you do these inspections, the more you're gonna get to know your trailer better. Mm -hmm. So if there is something wrong, you're going to notice a difference um, when when there is something wrong if you've inspected it when it's all in good shape. Mm -hmm. So if you don't, if you have never done the inspection before, and there is a slight weird gap or crack in the frame or something like that, you may not even notice it because it doesn't look any different than before you started. Mm -hmm. So it's good to do those all these inspections, you know. Some of it doesn't have to be done every trip. Um, some of it does, um, especially like lubing the, the grease certs and that sort of thing. That should be done um, fairly often. And the same but, thing goes with your tow vehicle, though, too. <laughs> yeah. Check your check your fluids, uh, check the tires, yeah. check, check it all. I mean, it's you're, again, you're putting these vehicles and these trailers through some really rough conditions, so it doesn't hurt to do them on both. Granted, I pay money to have mine checked out because I'm not only lazy, but I don't like getting my pretty fingernails dirty. <laughs> so hey, I'll pay you for an hour if you put it up on the jet on the uh, lift and just kind of, you know, kick the tires and what whatever you do. Yeah. <laughs> I used to be a mechanic and I'm just done. <laughs> I don't mind some wheel bearings. Again, you, you will be seeing a video coming out from me as soon as I get the wheel bearings from Opus. I will be changing them and I will be live streaming me actually from taking the whole tire off to packing the bearings, cleaning the brakes, probably going to go in there and adjust the brakes, um, and do the whole nine yards. That'll be a live stream. And I am working with Opus to start a new YouTube channel, and we're just going to flood it with content. From checking for maintenance to repairing, replacing, modifying. Um, apparently, I hear a rumor there's like a list of like 30-something videos that they've thought of and they want to put out. So... There's going to be a whole lot. I'm going to be going down to the factory to film most of these. So you'll get to see other trailers, see the place where they're all put together um, to make it a more intimate experience. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. So we're going to keep doing the live streams probably on this channel. So please subscribe. But there will be a ton of content coming out from Opus and myself here very, very soon. So stay tuned. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to reiterate that was out in the video was those seals on the propane tanks. Uh, I have seen them go bad, not on an Opus, but on my uh, propane tool, I don't know, the weed torches. And the O-ring on the torch end, not the tank end, it actually cracked. So when I screwed it in and turned on the tank, I could hear this tss, and I actually was able to just peel it off because it had cracked completely all the way through. Um, they do get chapped over time because they the the propane is extreme. It's a liquid gas, so it's extremely cold. Um, I've also had older tanks, the seal inside the where the where let's see the tank side where the the mail end threads in that crack also and chap and get old over time. The rubber dries out. I've seen that fail. So don't assume that just because it's snug and tight and your hose is in good condition um, that it's not something else inside the connection um, I do see posts about hey my propane uh, alarms going off but my hose is tight uh, well there may be something other than just being snug and tight you can buy gas detectors they're pretty inexpensive that'll do natural gas and propane I think they're like 10 or 20 bucks at Home Depot um, so you can just use that to check or use soap and water that's another simple solution um, the hose itself that goes from the regulator uh, down into or to the tank um, is exposed to a lot of sunlight. So if you don't keep your trailer covered uh, when you're not using it, 
uh, or in a garage when you're not using it, they will chap over time, they will crack, and they should be replaced immediately when you see any signs of drying, cracking, chipping, whatever, any kind of fatigue, change it out. It's not expensive, it's not hard, and the last thing you want is your opus to go up in flames. So, um, But again, check those little couple of little seals. This video will be put back up once I refilm some of the clips. The audio was a little, didn't like it so much. Um, I'll put this whole video back out minus this live stream portion. The live stream will stay live. You can always watch this, but the 20 minute section will be a little more concise and the audio will be much better. So subscribe so you'll get notified the moment it comes out because I will be making my own content separate from Opus since they are lending me an Opus light and it's the least I can do, right? <laughs> um, did you have more uh, things you wanted to go over, Adam? Yeah, just, uh, uh, just a couple quick more things. Um, on the trailer side of your of the hitch, um, that's one thing to inspect is make sure that there's no bends or cracks in that in that plate that attaches the hitch um, to the frame, um, because that's a huge connection point. So you want to make sure that that is um, all up to par. Um, Water tank support straps. Make sure that your your bolts, when you do your periodic inspection, this isn't something you have to do every time, but when you do just a full-on inspection of the trailer once every few trips, um, check the, the support straps for the water tanks. Make sure that all those bolts are, are tight um, and not loose. That's, you don't want to lose your water tank very very bad either so make sure that the water the support straps and the bolts are all tight and snug and just kind of an inspection of that um so one thing i i will say that i was trained in in class b driving school while towing um that is a very good thing to to use while just towing the trailer is it's called a Z scan. So basically what every few miles, um, you look at your gauges, your instrument cluster on your vehicle, then you make sure all that's, you know, you're going the right speed limit. Um, all your gauges are looking good. Then you scan over to your, um, driver's side mirror, look down your, your side of your vehicle. Um, I'll even do it a lot of times when I'm going around a turn um, on the freeway or on the road or whatever, and I can see the tire on the trailer. Um, I'll just glance in my, do that C scan while I'm going around a turn and I'll glance in my mirror and I can check, I can see my tire on the Opus. Um, I can see the side of the Opus. And then from there, you go all the way over to your passenger side mirror. Um, and do the same thing. Just check your mirror. Make sure you don't see any rubber flapping off the flat tire or, or <laughs> mud flap, off, anything like that. Yeah, and then from there you go to your rearview mirror. You can from there you can check your load on your roof rack, um, and make sure that everything's tied down properly and it's not moving around. There's no straps moving around. So it's basically from instrument cluster, driver's side mirror passenger side mirror rear view mirror so it's it's kind of a weird kind of a z but it is kind of a z pattern so if you get in the habit of doing that um every few miles um it may save some serious issues um and not only that but just watching traffic you know as you're going down the freeway and making sure some some crazy person isn't trying to do something stupid which it's Go can ahead. happen. Uh, I would uh, not emphasize, but I'm, I don't have any other word than emphasize. The scanning of the side view mirrors, I think, is really important because you can memorize where the traffic is. And if you have to make an abrupt lane change, say a squirrel yep. runs in front of you, um, you're likely, if you're on a constant, you know, the Z pattern back and forth, but, you know, focusing on the road, you're going to know, it, well, I'm better off either running the squirrel over or going to the shoulder or going into the, the passing lane or... You know, I'm in the passing lane. It's, you know, either way, you're going to know better. But also watching for those guys that are going, you know, we're doing 55. <clears throat> we always do 55. 
and you get a driver that's doing um you know 75 or 80 which is only 10 or 15 over for a passenger car not a big deal um it's uh it's good to know they're coming so if you're planning a lane change or if you're in a caravan like we were on the opus run we were like eight vehicles hey there's a jeep back here or hey dude, you got somebody in a honda that's doing like probably a thousand miles an hour they're coming up on your you know whatever side um, it's good to know what's going on uh but it's it, just pay attention to stuff and for me it's also gauges I, i'm like something about gauges <laughs> just like focus on yeah. the transmission temperature <laughs> yeah i mean you should i my I'm lucky enough that my truck has a, a transmission tap sensor when it's hooked up to a trailer. It doesn't have one when I'm not towing. Um, it's part of my navigation thing on my truck. But when I am hooked up to a trailer, it'll tell me the, the transmission temperature, but which I check definitely periodically um, when I'm going down the road, um, check and make sure my, my temperature is where it needs to be. But um, all, all your gauges on your vehicle uh, just check them periodically and that goes with just you know owning a vehicle in, in general but um i will mention too that trailers trailer wheel bearings are very susceptible to heat more than almost anything else and the faster you drive with the trailer the higher chance you have of running risk of overheating wheel bearings and um, having some serious issues with your hubs and your bearings and seals and all that. So my recommendation is try and keep it below 70. Um, that's kind of my rule of thumb. I don't have a choice as, you know, having a class B, I, I can't afford a, a ticket. So I don't have a choice, but that's their really 65 to 70 is is your is kind of your limit to towing i have I'll, I'll admit i've done you know 74 75 on the freeway once in a while but that is the that is the safe towing range and dylan you know you know i know you know you know that that it, there's times where you get in a hurry and you're you're going a little fast and i've i'm guilty of it but that is the safe that is the safe range for for towing a trailer is anywhere from even 60 to 70 miles an hour. So it's just what you feel comfortable with. Um, there's no problem with going 60 miles an hour while towing. There's no problem at all. Yeah. Some states, isn't the speed limit 75 when towing? I think it's like Texas well, or something. There's some speed limits that are higher. Yeah. Not yeah. to say you should drive yeah. that speed. I'm, I'm not advocating doing that. I'm just like brainstorming here with you. Yeah, and I don't know other states. I know, you know, in Montana, from where I'm from, um, I think 65 is normally what the towing speed limit is. Um, but, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of danger involved in getting, going 80, towing 80, 85 miles an hour with a trailer. Mm -hmm. um, your reaction time and the weight that you're pushing or you're pulling down the highway, if you have to stop and you're doing 85 miles an hour with even a 4,000 pound Opus trailer, um, it's gonna take you a lot longer to stop than if you were doing 65. Well, it's, throw this part into that same equation though. If you're towing with say a Tacoma uh, or one of these smaller SUVs, sure. they're only what, 5,000 pounds, 6,000 well, pounds? That and you're, and their brake drums, their disc brakes aren't as big on their on their mm -hmm. vehicle mm -hmm. because they're not. You know, you're you're getting up towards the top end of, of your capacity, the capacity yeah. for those for those uh, vehicles. So, yeah, it's not worth it. It's not worth getting to your campsite ten minutes earlier <laughs> over a five hundred mile yeah. trip um, to do. 85 miles an hour it's, it's not where it's like i've told people in the past it's better to arrive safe than not at all yeah there is so, that the, my that, problem that, is is like when we were important. on the opus run with you guys uh and pepper started driving on the freeway we're again we're driving a diesel three-quarter ton truck a <laughs> late model it's got power yeah. to no end i can pull seventeen thousand pounds is what it's rated to and opus is what an opus light is like 33 3500 pounds uh it also our truck is four-wheel drive so 
the when you look in the rear view you can really only see the spare tire <laughs> you don't even know the darn thing is back there so when she was driving she's like whoa i'm going <laughs> like, oh my god i'm going too fast slow down you're barely even touching the throttle with that turbo spools up and you don't even feel the thing back there when you're going from a stop and i hit the fuel to, you don't know it's back there so to go accidentally go over the speed limit is is too easy um, because these yeah. things are so light but, but i would emphasize that the, the the smaller the vehicle the more important it is to go slower because you've got almost as much weight behind you as you do the towing vehicle so to stop it yeah. is you know it's a, a lot of you know i see these uh like a little honda suvs towing these double axle you know big rvs and you're like well it's within my towing capacity well, yeah, it's not a matter of getting the trailer going as much as it is how fast can you stop it. Sure, you can tow it, and, you know, we're not going to get into the, the longevity of the vehicle of, you know, being shortened because of the smaller vehicle, but it's the stopping. If you do have that squirrel run in front of you, can you stop it without having it, you know, fishtail down the road? That's the important thing. Um, I'm at what I'm almost 9,000 pounds when I have uh, nothing in the truck but a full tank of fuel that's double the trailer weight. So I'm not going to have as big an issue and I'm trying to justify my driving 60 miles an hour, but just bringing up some food for thought that if you're driving a lighter vehicle, it's even more important to watch your speed because you're going to have issues stopping. Actually, I think we just had a mutual friend that the one tire had gone over the edge of the road for some reason, and it caused them to start to fishtail and they were driving a Lexus SUV and they were not able to recover from the fishtail. So again, it's even more important. And I don't know what speed they were going or what was going on, but it's really, really important. I should, yeah. I'm just on this and, like tangent, I should stop. <laughs> well, and like I've, I've told people in the Facebook group that towing is actually one of the most dangerous things you can do with your vehicle. So when things go wrong, things can go wrong really fast. And um, worse. <laughs> But yeah, and it can be way worse. So it's it's something to take seriously and, and um, make sure that you do the periodic inspections and you do uh, check your tires and your chains and all these things because it can, I've seen, I mean, I think almost everyone has seen YouTube videos of, of people pulling trailers and, and a tire blowing or something mm -hmm. like that and it gets bad real fast mm -hmm. so um you're better off to tow safely do your inspections when when needed um and make sure the trailer is maintained and serviced properly and you'll eliminate so much of that um and just the headache of of having breakdowns and um having to do repairs on your trip um you're better off to do it before your trip than while you're on your trip it just makes it <laughs> so much more fun i mean yeah exactly no one wants to no one wants to do that um sometimes and it's gonna happen i mean there's there's no way of getting around it that things can break on the trail and things can break on your trip and uh, but you can minimize that by doing some inspections and walk arounds and um uh, maintenance issues Murphy's Law. What so, can go wrong will go wrong. But an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure. So, Exactly. Um, I would, um, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to just blurt, or not blurt out, but say that uh, if you are watching and you are an Opus owner, Adam and I are both on uh, what uh, Opus Owners Group. And then what's your group on Facebook? Op West Coast Opus? West Coast Opus Overland. So we can be found there. Uh, if you did find if you do find because we're not finished quite yet uh, i would throw your questions in the comments uh, pretty soon here because we are pretty close to done um if you found this information good and would like to see more of it i would encourage you if you're on the opus owners group go back to the thread where you found the link to this video and say thank you or something about it because opus does see that and they will help us enable us to do more content uh, if you also have topics that you think are important for other people to know or are driving you nuts please drop it in that same uh, that same uh, comment on the group and we will do our best to work with them to bring you that content like this one here we thought was really important and had people ask. So please do us a favor and go in the Opus group and say, yay, that was awesome. <laughs> so back over to you, Adam. 
Um, I think just in closing, um, my my kind of my final comment is uh, get to know your trailer. Like, take some time when you're not preparing for a trip or you're uh, doing something like that, or even when you're doing your pre-inspection, and just like crawl around your trailer, see where the wires go, see where the water hoses go, where they tie in with the pump, um, where the wires go from the battery to the NOCO charger, um, wires from your stereo, wires from your CO2 detector, wires from your uh, propane leak detector. Um, just get to know your trailer as best you can because um, it's just going to be a, a better experience for you and it it can save you some time if, if you're having any issues the better you know your trailer um, the easier it's going to be for you to fix things and fix possibly something simple um, just a loose connection or a loose wire or, or something like that that just Take some time and, and get to know your trailer and crawl around underneath of it and crawl around inside and look at the, the compartments on the inside of the, and the batteries and all the electrical components and all that stuff because it's just good, useful information to have. Like, how does the trailer run? How does it operate? Where does everything go? And the nice thing about the Opus trailers is it's all cut and dry. It's all right in front of you. Um, there's no hidden compartments like on big fifth wheel trailers where you got to dig into the uh, storage compartments <laughs> and get way in there to find all the electrical and all the plumbing that runs through the whole trailer it's like it's all right there so just take some time and and learn your trailer it'll it'll save you some headaches in the long run absolutely absolutely so um there's i guess we've answered everybody's questions there's no new comments um so with that, I would uh, say, please, if you don't have any of those tools, help this channel out. And um, in the description is the link to Amazon to buy them yourself. Uh, if Even if you are not going to buy those tools, if you plan to do some shopping on Amazon in the next 24 hours, click the link because it tells Amazon that, hey, this guy gets a cut. So if you buy something in the next 24 hours, um, I get a small, very, very small portion but it helps me out because again, I'm not being paid for this with any monetary. There's no money being exchanged with it. So I would really appreciate it. Um, hit the subscribe button. Uh, the like button is huge. Comments are awesome. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you for watching. Feel free to reach out to either one of us. We'll do our best to help you out. Um, and I think that's about it. So uh, with that said, I'd say Adam, hold on for a moment and we're going to wave goodbye and say bye-bye. Thank you for joining us and we'll uh, see you in the next live stream.